Thank you all. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you, John and Liz, also for the plugs for my books. I can't appreciate that enough. I promise to get you a check later on. <laughs> and it is wonderful to be up here with my friends, with Dan, with Liz, with Nick, debating a very important topic. I thought I'd start where Nick le left off. I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about the potential for a peaceful resolution. And we need to recognize that there is the prospect. We don't know, and I say this as someone who has studied Iran for over two decades, at the CIA, at the Department of Defense, at the National Security Council, and in the think tank world. We don't really know what the Iranians want. We don't really know what they'd be willing to give. And in direct answer to Dan's question of what might it take, have we get, why have they not taken the choice already? Well, we haven't put the choice to them directly. The choice that we need to put to them is a very simple one. You get to have a good, thriving economy, which is ultimately what the people of Iran want, or you get a nuclear weapon, but you don't get both. The critical thing that you need to keep in mind, and I don't think that Liz and Dan necessarily disagree with that, but the critical thing that you need to get, keep in mind is how we get to that choice how we force the Iranians to recognize that they get to have one or the other, not both. They don't get to have their cake and eat it too. I agree that this regime in Iran is not yet ready to sit down and compromise with us. I think they've made a tactical decision to talk to us. They have not made the strategic decision to compromise with us. And so the question becomes, how do we get them to that point? Well, as Liz very nicely described, we tried. When I was first in the Clinton White House at the NSC working on Iran, it was 1995-96, the period when the Clinton administration, of which I was a part and working on Iran, imposed comprehensive unilateral sanctions against Iran. And these sanctions hurt. Do not believe for a second that those sanctions were meaningless. They hurt Iran, and they hurt Iran to this day. But they haven't hurt Iran enough to force them to make that choice, to make it the way that we want them to. Later on, we tried in 1998, 99, my second time in the White House, to bring the rest of the world on board because we recognized that the only way to put that kind of pressure on the Iranians was to get the support of the world, to get them on board with the same kind of sanctions, which could inflict the kind of pain on the Iranians that would force them to make that choice, the choice that they're trying to avoid. And what we found was that the rest of the world wasn't ready. And Nick and Liz tried the same thing during the Bush administration, and they found the same thing. And what we consistently heard over and over and over again was you have not made a good faith effort with the Iranians. You've not put a deal on the table that they might accept. You have not given them a chance to say yes. Now, we can debate about whether that's true or not, but the simple fact is, that's what the rest of the world believes. And until we convince them otherwise, they're not going to join us in imposing harsher sanctions on Iran, the kind of sanctions that might force the Iranians to come to that decision. Now, the second thing that I want to do is to talk a little bit about what happens if we stop the diplomacy. Because we do need to think about that. It's the elephant in the living room. If we're not talking to Iran, we've got to be doing something else. And as I said, unilateral sanctions, no matter how clever both the Clinton and Bush administrations were in imposing unilateral sanctions, those don't seem to be enough. And so if those aren't going to be enough and we're not going to try the diplomacy, that is the one way that we might be able to get international support for the kind of harsh sanctions on Iran that might change their mind, well, our alternatives start to look a lot worse. And I say that as someone who is very realistic about the chances of diplomacy with Iran. I could add, Nick could as well, a half dozen other problems to the ones that Liz and Dan have already mentioned. Okay, we've been through it. We know how hard it is to deal with the Iranians. But the simple fact is that diplomacy is much better than any of the other options. All the options stink. But some of them stink a lot worse than others. Option one, we could do nothing. We could sit back and try to contain the Iranians and deter them once they've got nuclear weapons. I don't know about the rest of you, but that's a social science experiment I'd prefer not to run. Okay? We don't know what the Iranians will do when they have a nuclear weapon. I tend to doubt they'd actually use it, but I'm not certain, and I wouldn't want to find out that I was wrong. And even if I am right about it, we're going to face an aggressive Iran, one that is going to be much more willing to support its terrorist allies all across the Middle East. 
The last thing that the Middle East needs is more trouble, more instability, more Iranian-assisted troublemaking in the region. And that's exactly what we get if we simply allow them to have the nuclear weapon. Another alternative is regime change. We go in there and we decide we're going to get rid of the governments. And the way that people typically think about regime change in Iran is we're going to spark a popular revolution. And people say that because the truth is that, as best we can tell, most Iranians don't really like their government. And they'd like to see it change. The problem with this is that revolutions are very unpredictable and they're very rare. And we don't really know how to get one started in Iran. And beyond that, we have what's called, what I call, the Groucho Marx problem. That every, remember Groucho once famously said that he wouldn't want to be a member of any club that would have him as a member? Well, every Iranian oppositionist who accepts money from the United States of America is probably not someone we should be giving money to. Because <laughs> they probably work for the Iranian intelligence services and they probably don't have any support among the Iranian people because since 1953, when we overthrow Mossadegh, we have been the third rail of Iranian politics. And the last option that's out there, and I don't think anyone on the panel is arguing for this, but let's remember it, is war. Okay? We can try airstrikes against the Iranian nuclear program. But don't think that this is going to be a quick surgical strike. Okay? The Iranian program is big, it is dispersed, it is hardened. It is going to require hundreds, if not thousands, of sorties to take down that program. And most of the intelligence people I've spoken to, including the Israelis, believe that even a wildly successful strike would probably only set the program back by one or two, maybe if we got really lucky, three or four years. And the Iranians will retaliate, and they will rebuild, and we will have to strike again. Okay? This will not be a surgical operation. It will, as Nick said, be an open-ended war, another open-ended war in the Middle East. These are all paths that we may have to confront at some point in time, but I'd suggest to you that we shouldn't do so until we have made damn sure that there is no diplomatic solution. We're not there yet. And let's just remember the very wise words of Franklin Roosevelt, a man who was determined to wage World War II because he knew it was the right thing to do, but who famously once said that jaw-jaw is better than wall-wall. Thank you.